All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the AI Institute for Next Generation Food Systems Spring Speaker <laughs> Series. My name is Hannah Bertram and I'm the Education and Public Engagement Coordinator for APHIS. And today we are delighted to welcome Jacqueline Hawkrider, Global Director of Sustainability and Marketing at Evergreen. She will discuss artificial intelligence unlocking nutrition for brewers spent grain protein. Before I introduce Jacqueline, let me give a quick introduction to the AI Institute for Next Generation Food Systems, also known as AIFS or APHIS. The Institute was established in 2020 under an NSF USDA NIFA grant with the mission of developing and leveraging transformative AI for the ethical production and distribution of safe, sustainable, nutritious food with fewer resources. APHIS is a multidisciplinary collaboration between researchers at six different institutions, connecting research with a holistic view of the food system, solving challenges in molecular breeding, agricultural production, food processing and distribution, and nutrition, and the people behind the food system using AI and technology as enablers. If you would like more information on the research and engagement activities of APHIS, please visit our website and connect with us on social media. Our speaker series features thought leaders addressing food system challenges using artificial intelligence. The speaker series will be themed around AI opportunities in food waste reduction. Upcoming speakers include Emily Ma, head of Google's Food for Good initiative, and Scott Forsberg, the chief operating officer of Whole Vine Products. Today, I'm delighted to be introducing Jacqueline Hawkrider. Jacqueline is a passionate business-centric professional currently leading global sustainability and marketing activities for Evergreen by AB InBev, an impact-driven business focused on upcycled barley products. Jacqueline began work at the world's largest brewer on a graduate program seven years ago, taking on projects across the value chain. Jacqueline held different positions within sales, and sales strategy, new business development, corporate communications and procurement sustainability in Stockholm, New York, Brussels, and London before being appointed to sustainability and marketing director for Evergreen, an AB InBev company in August, 2021. She's since been on a mission to give upcycled barley ingredients a voice, embedding sustainability and social impact programming across a business full of promise. Jacqueline studied economics and law at the University of Cape Town and received a master's in international management from the ESSEC Business School. Today's discussion will be moderated by Harold Schmitz, co-founder and general partner of March Capital US LLC and a senior scholar in the Graduate School of Management at UC Davis. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jacqueline, and I will pass it over to you. My absolute pleasure, Hannah. Thank you so much for the introduction, and I'm delighted to be with you here today and some of the some of you who might join here in the future, um, just to, to share with you guys as we're humbled to be part of this multidisciplinary collaboration. And I look forward to seeing what you guys do in the future in AIFS. We'll be tracking you um, from our seat to Evergreen. But um, just to, to give you a little uh, introduction to our business, our, um, our purpose here at Evergreen, um, I just wanted to share a couple of slides with you, and then we can get into to the chat here with, with Harold. So who is Evergreen? You may have heard of, of AB InBev, um, less likely to have heard of, of Evergreen. Hopefully, you know, that changes as we, we continue to grow and evolve into the future. Um, Evergreen is a sustainable ingredient business by the world's largest brewing company. You may have heard of some of the the world's greatest beer brands, as we say, Budweiser, Stella Artois, Corona, uh, Mick Ultra, just a, a wonderful portfolio that obviously brings a lot of joy and celebration to people all over the world. But it also has a uh, sort of a counterpart. It's, it's got a huge um, piece of, of what's currently going to food waste or animal feed as part of that brewing step. And that's what we call the brewer's spent grains, right? So beer 101, you throw the, the barley or the corn or the rice into the brew kettle. The starch is solubilized, goes on to become beer. And what, what is left over is this, um, this wonderful, nutritious um, macro and micro content called brewer's spent grains. It's corn, rice, barley, um, protein, and fiber you know, in, its, in its simplest form. And um, 
Our story dates back to around 2013 when our founder and, and current CEO, Gregory Belt, looked at this particular side stream of the brewing process and just marveled at the scale of the, the potential, the opportunity that was the protein and fiber, as well as all the micronutrients, the phytonutrients that, that this raw material presented. So first step um, was to partner with some of the brightest minds in, um, in food science. We went out to UC College Cork um, in Ireland and looked at some of the ways that we could transform that brewer's spent grains into what we now call brewer's saved grains. How could we save that grain and, and grab the nutritional content, as well as developing a way to help people get their protein from a more environmental friendly source? Um, Fast forward to 2016, we found a incredible startup out of Minnesota that was actually extracting the protein through technology. And Anheuser-Busch at the time made an investment into that startup, which launched us into 2019 pilot scale operations. We took that protein technology. Um, we worked with uh, food institutes, um, application institutes, just people who understand how to take an ingredient from, you know, what it is in its, in its native form into a wonderful consumer experience. Um, and that led us to a place in 2021 where we had a $100 million investment put up by Anheuser-Busch um, to get our first ever pro facility up and running at scale here in St. Louis, Missouri, um, United States. So the world is, quite frankly, our oyster. We do have over sort of 200 brewing facilities and counting all over the world through the Anheuser-Busch network. Um, the St. Louis operation is just the beginning of what could be a wonderful adventure in creating food systems change and thinking how we could play a role in, in the greater um, shift to sustainable ingredients or upcycled ingredients. And simply put, what we what we say here at Evergreen is our um, protein ingredient, what I was just telling you, you all about, is called Everpro. We say it's protein redefined. And it's really simple. It has um, superior taste, it has better nutrition, and it has quantifiably lower carbon, water, and land use footprint than any other protein that's currently available at scale today. And the scale piece is really important because a lot of these technologies, a lot of the way that sort of digitization and, and um, you know, real kind of forward-looking ingredients and, and food systems changes viewed as stuff that just doesn't exist at scale today. Like this is, you know, in, in, Everpro, in Everpro's case, this is happening. Um, we have that 7,000 ton annual output facility and we do have the data which tells us, um, the, you know, the promise, shows us the promise of Everpro as well as the consumer adoption, which is now beginning to come through in, in the marketplace. Um, so I'll spend the, the next maybe five, 10 ish minutes just going through these different pillars and helping you guys see for yourselves, welcome your challenges, welcome the conversation, because of course there is no silver bullet, but we do believe that Everpro has incredible promise um, due to its superior taste, nutrition, sustainability, and overall functional performance, which you'll see here in a, in a second. So what does superior taste mean to us? I, I mean, I imagine many of you have different tastes, even in your households and your families, you like different things. Um, and there is a perception in, you know, sustainable eating, green eating, if you will, that that comes with a certain level of sacrifice, you know, that you have to sacrifice a really indulgent taste. You have to sacrifice, uh, you know, a familiar taste, something that you grew up loving that is no longer considered healthy, good, or, or you know, um, something that you should eat due to its, its animal-based uh, origins. But what if you could, could eat something which is quantifiably better tasting for a majority, if not almost all Americans? Um, and that's what Everpro presents. It's, you know, it's a protein that has this incredible superpower, which is solubility. You'll see here in a second. And that helps us to get up to around a 10 to 1 preference versus some of the biggest protein shakes out there today, your market-leading animal-based protein shake, your market-leading plant-based protein shake, which is currently a combination of pea and rice. Um, and this was a National Food Labs panel just out here in California with people who drink protein shakes on the regular. So they know what they like, they know they, they're, you know, they're participants in the category, and the data really just speaks for itself. 
And as mentioned, this is, you know, this is truly differentiated taste wise because of the fact that Everpro has this solubility profile. You could just see it right holding there at the top, close to 100%, where most other plant proteins are, um, are not soluble, which means doesn't mean that they, they don't have a place in the food system. They're, they're great in crunchy applications or, um, you know, in base food applications, but in beverage and something where you want that silky, smooth feeling going down your throat, they're just not going to cut it from a, from a taste perspective. So this graph is actually a great representation of how plants work, work harder together. You know, if you want to get your food and drink uh, throughout the day, you want to have nutrients from different sources in variety and abundance. You don't have to eat animal-based everything throughout the day. You can get a lot of pea hair, a little bit of um, body protein there in your food and your drink through new innovations and ideally through, through digitization, accelerating some of those great um, sort of taste, performance and nutrition benefits um, out into the market pretty soon. Moving on to nutrition. Now, this is really where the, the rubber hits the road because you might, you know, you might be convinced on the taste piece, but there's a part of you that might be thinking, well, if it tastes so good, is it really good for my body? Is it going to nutrify me? Is it going to get me what I need? And um, barley is actually an ancient grain. It's been around for 10,000 plus years. It was cultivated by the ancient Egyptians and, and Romans. And it was really loved for its, its nutrition profile and balance. It has protein, it has carbs, it has vitamins, minerals. Um, through the brewing process, we grab all that starch, all that carbohydrate, all that sugar, and that heads into creating uh, fermentation or creating alcohol through fermentation. What's left over is this incredible unadulted protein, vitamin, and mineral nutrient profiles, all with low to no anti-nutrients. Nothing wrong with anti-nutrients as long as you don't get too much of them, but it's great to have zero or close to zero anti-nutrients um, at, at the beginning of your relationship with a certain food or ingredient. And as people are looking to get you know, more of their, their foods, their macros from plant-based food or beverage, um, it's important to make sure that you're getting people what, what they need. You know, there are some concerns about bioavailability of certain plant proteins. Are you getting all the proteins that you think you're getting when you look at the back label? And Everpro has quantifiably um, proven that all of the amino acids, uh, including, you know, your nine essential amino acids are present in barley protein. And Everpro also has an incredible promise for sports nutrition application. So not everybody's a sports person, but everybody can benefit from, you know, exercising and making sure they get their nutrition right after working out. Um, what Everpro can get you is your branch chain amino acids. For, for those of you who work out, you know that that really helps you to build the muscle that you need for uh, muscle growth and performance. It's going to get you the amino acid glutamine, uh, which is also linked in, in the scientific literature with reduced muscle fatigue and enhanced post-workout uh, recovery, making sure you can get back at it faster and better. And it also has what's called the, uh, the digestible indispensable amino acid score, the DIAS, the new WHO standard for protein digestibility measurements. And it's got the highest of any palm protein available today. Right. So it really does stand out. If you want to get your protein as quick as possible after you work out, um, that Everpro is the, the protein for you. And this is, yeah, this is just uh, coming back to the point made a second ago about the concerns with digestibility of, of plant proteins. Not all plant proteins are created equal. So you're going to see different absorption rates. You're going to see the barley protein as well as the pea protein um, right up there at the top on digestibility. So just a great way to get your protein from a plant-based source where you see you're actually marginally superior to, to whey protein in, in this particular chart. And last, but certainly not least, uh, sustainability. So we do have, you know, we're living in a time where sustainability is not just top of mind, but it's it's now and ever in terms of thinking about the ways that we transform our daily lives to, to accommodate um, sort of a, a new normal here. So when we think about something as simple as a food choice, that, for me, it just gives me a sense of relief that you can just make a simple choice that helps you to systematically reduce or avoid carbon emissions going forward. 
um, as well as, you know, getting your nutrients, um, getting everything you need, you need to nourish your body, not having to sacrifice on that piece, um, or from a local source uh, that is plentiful and would otherwise be going to, to waste. So what that translates out to, just to give you guys a picture here of the, the carbon footprint, the land use and the water use reductions that you can achieve through just a simple tablespoon of evapor in your, in your diet as opposed to getting you know, your protein from egg white or steak or, um, or chicken or other sources, is a, a real reduction in carbon footprint. Uh, land use, of course, linked to the upcycled potential here, the fact that you grow the barley for the purpose of brewing beer. We know that beer is not going anywhere. And, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're using a single square foot of land for double the purpose, the beer purpose, as well as the protein, fiber, and other fiber, mineral nutrients uh, potential. Water usage, incredibly low. Um, as we know, water is such a precious resource, and it's so intimately linked with the carbon cycle that water is just, you know, it really is the key to unlocking some of the, the carbon stability that we hope for in the future. So great to see the, the low score there on, on that side too. And this is really, you know, it's scalable. Every incremental um, protein kilogram that's sold is a carbon unit, a land unit, and a water unit that's not used or wasted, as well as the food waste that's avoided uh, through this new innovative use of, of burst and grain. So you might be wondering, where can I find this stuff? How can I help you guys? How can I actually, um, yeah, put, put the protein in my body that is, is so good for me? So we have just come online with our large scale facility uh, June of last year. Um, as many of you know that, you know, the way to get into food products can be anywhere from a year to five years of innovation process and cycle. Uh, we're not disillusioned at all about how long this could take. We're going to chat in a second about how that can potentially be accelerated through, through digital technologies. But we have had some early wins, which we're super proud of. You'll find us in store um, for, for um, Garden of Life MD Protein. You'll find us online for bulksupplements.com. You can just throw that in and you'll be able to order yourself some. Uh, to try at home. It's unadulted, it's unformulated, it's that's your best bet to try ever prone in its natural form. And then in other parts of the world, we've also had some launches in meat alternative applications at an innovation trial sort of stage um, and a partnership that we announced with Post Early for both regenerative agriculture research purposes and the, the upcycle protein um, nutrient fortification for their, their clouds there. And that's, you know, from a partner, partnership perspective, that's where you'll find us in the, in the marketplace. Um, what we believe is possible, however, is just, you know, is so much broader than that, just based on our innovation uh, pipeline as at today. We've just launched what you can see here right up front uh, is a clear protein, which is simply revolutionary. It's, it truly is redefining protein as we know it today. Um, if any of you can find a great tasting plant-based clear protein hydration beverage in the marketplace, send it our way. We haven't come across it just yet. Um, and we can get you up to 20 grams of protein in a 10 ounce serving, which is you know, just a little, little drink with your lunch. Um, and you can eat whatever you want, your vegetables, your, your plant-based diet without worrying about a protein deficiency following that plant-based diet. Um, through, you know, through getting that protein from a sustainable and nutritious source um, as, a, as a beverage in combination with your lunch. So we're super excited about some of those applications. I mean, liquid IV sticks, if you haven't tried them, give them a go. They do, you know, it's a great way to start your day, especially if you, if you need that extra energy boost. Um, and we just see convenience playing such a big role in people's lives these days where um, a powdered soluble protein is, is simply going to be game changing for the ways that they, they live their lives day to day. So with that being said, we'd love to continue the conversation. Do reach out. Uh, please do scan this QR code. You can download our very own Bali report, which just is a wonderful resource to understand the natural nutritional potential of Bali and upcycle Bali. Um, and check out our new website. We just launched it last week. So excited for the, the rest of the conversation.
Um, so shall I take it away, guys? Great. Yeah. Um, so number one, thank you very much for, for that, Jack. You really appreciate it. And I definitely want to encourage people to submit, um, you know, submit questions. And, and Hannah is uh, monitoring things. So, you know, if you submit questions, then then we'll see them and we'll definitely get to them. So um, we're really excited about this series, which is focused on um, upcycled ingredients and the food waste um, you know, the food waste situation. It's in terms of our overall food system. Um, and Emily Ma will talk to us about this, but in terms of the overall, you know, sort of food system thinking, call it a hidden part of the food system, is actually this food waste piece. And so Steve and I were talking, you know, before this, and and it uh, and Emily will talk more when when we when we hear from her. But you know, something on the order of 160 billion U.S. dollars per year comprises this, you know, hidden part of the overall food system. So we need to figure out. You know how to use that um, and how to how to you know figure that out faster and better. And obviously, this is where the uh, data analytics and the data science um, come to to play on that. And I'll also put in a plug for I believe a faculty member of APHIS is Ned Spang, if I recall correctly. And Ned is a part of our very own food science and technology department, and so it, he he leads you know, significant food waste, reducing food waste and food loss initiative. So with that sort of as the picture, Jackie, thank you for that. I really appreciated um, the slides you showed because I think what is really interesting about what Evergrain is doing and, and ABN Bev is doing is you really are expanding this food system perspective. So there's the, you know, there's barley as a, as a crop and the key part of BSG and all that's involved in developing that crop. And then there's converting that into the primary, you know, sort of product and, and then distributing that and so on and so forth. And now what you guys are doing, of course, is, is that you're, um, you are um, figuring out how to expand the envelope of what you have um, and create an entire new business out of it. Excuse me. And not only is it a business that is just focused on one product, but you're creating a platform business that can go into, you know, ingredients for a whole bunch of other other products. So big food system, very ambitious. How do we do this faster, better, and more cost effectively? And so that's uh, you know, that's where the the data analytics and the AI piece comes in. So I have a few questions that I definitely would like to get to asking you, which we'll do now. Um, and we'll we'll watch those coming in from from the rest of the group. But like the first question definitely is so in as you you know as you guys at Evergreen think about this, how you know, what are you most excited about from a data science perspective, data analytics, and you know actually using AI? What you know what what excites you guys the most about interfacing with this technology? Yeah, so great great way to kick us off there, Harold and. Um... You know, I, I've given you guys a pretty comprehensive, hopefully, introduction into into what Evergreen is and and why we exist. Um, but I mean, just to to come back to our core purpose, you know, when when Greg Belt originally looked at this protein and fiber going out the door, he thought there must be a better way. You know, like, like how can we realize the untapped potential in all of this nutrition? And uh, when you think about the sort of the team that he's built, the world class R and D that it took to build and to, to get to what Evergreen is today, just ten years later, we have a real shot of being, you know, the next P with soy protein, um, getting into the marketplace step by step. Um, it really is about how do we do this right from the beginning? Because there is no time to to lose. You know, we we've got this food system which is legacy. It's not quite working for us if we see. The amount of greenhouse gas that's attributed to food today is, you know, it's basically like the fourth largest polluting country in the world behind US, China and, and, and India. Um, and it's all fragmented and it's all kind of, it's all decentralized in the way that we, we organize ourselves. What if we could take the future of food, which is an upcycle business or a, you know, any kind of new way of thinking about food, um, food system technologies or food system applications, and embed data and 21st century science into that process upfront. So even though we were considered a, you know, basically a startup within the ABM ecosystem and we're, we're making our way and we're selling to be able to 
to get our business off the ground, we do have the luxury, if you will, of, of being a legacy food company's baby and and an entrepreneurship story inside this huge food company or beverage company rather's um, legacy. And there is a way for us to think about artificial intelligence, data science, and data platforms at the very beginning of our journey so that we don't build this legacy company that we look back on in 50 years time and we just made the same mistakes that everybody else made 50 years ago and 100 years ago. So let me give you just a, a concrete example of that, if, if I may. Um, Harold, we've partnered up actually with UC Davis's very own Pippa, which has been incubated, I believe, in this very building in the, in the genome and biosciences building. Um, and Pippa is setting out to make the scoping. In fact, they've got a bunch of different things going on. But what we're, what we're collaborating with them on is to look at reducing down the time to scoping a clinical trial. How do you think about the clinical data that's required for a macronutrient like protein and some of the other micronutrients that may or may not exist within that macro as, as a single source of nutrition? Where would you even begin? I mean, there are millions of molecules that could, could be the one that you wanted to do the clinical trial on to prove the efficacy um, in, human, in human bodies. And the AI piece of PIPA is taking, you know, those hundreds of thousands of potential molecules. And in particular, we're looking for polyphenols, right? Which, you know, a lot more about than I do. But um, from what I understand, there are just like tons and tons of them. Um, and they come in different combinations and shapes and forms, and they have different interactions with your body. But one of those interactions could be an anti-inflammatory or an antioxidant effect. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what I was telling you guys earlier about you know, sports nutrition and protein applications, if you, if you want to have that muscle recovery and you want to have that muscle growth, what about coupling that with anti-inflammation, reducing the soreness in your muscles at the same time as you're getting nutrients that you need to grow your muscles? That is, you know, that's something that no other protein would be able to say. Mm -hmm. But where do we begin? So the PIPA team is helping us to take something that could take years to scope down to a matter of weeks, which I didn't quite believe at first, but we've been working with these guys for just a couple of, of months now, and they've already delivered two sets of results. And it's just catapulting us into the, the next stage of the process, which is you know working with some of the best food scientists and nutrition scientists in the world to say, okay, cool, now that we identify this particular molecule with unprecedented speed and accuracy, how do we prove the efficacy in a human trial? And we're going to look at getting those trial results back in, in under a year when historically companies, food companies or green companies have looked at sort of five, 10 year clinical trial cycles to get to a similar result. Wow. I need to learn more about this AI stuff. But um, anyway, <laughs> having, having been a, a traditional, you know, for 30 years at this food and nutrition interface, I think you just, that was a really nice summary of the faster, better, more cost effectively, you know, opportunity that that AI can offer in the food system. And, um, and I just realized I was speaking into you know, the nether sphere in, in this uh, in the studio here. It's the first time we've done an in-person, you know, program here for a while. So now I'm, I'm back looking at in the, in the right way here. But um, in any case, that was a really nice description. So we actually had a talk here during a previous speaker session, and it was focused on um, plant science and crop breeding and actually the nutrition you know, sort of attributes that were in plants and how to accelerate plant breeding for nutrition. So given, you know, given that talk that we've had, and that's part of the APHIS ecosystem is actually crop breeding and plant science. Um, what's your view on barley crop research? And is that something that ABI is involved in? And, and do you foresee um, data analytics and AI being involved in that process to perhaps, you know, create barley that has higher levels of polyphenols or these other attributes that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Great to hear how the company thinks about that. Yeah, 100%. And um, I think Hannah mentioned in my introduction, I, I used to take care of sustainability for, for Europe. So I was quite intimately involved in some of the agronomic programs for Anheuser-Busch and, and ABM birth more globally um, just two or three years ago. And just the, the level of technology that the business applies and continues to apply to breeding barley is 
spectacular. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. Um, we have a saying in the company, which is no Bali, no beer. And <laughs> my goal is one day to have our, some, let's say 150,000 people say no Bali, no protein, no polyphenols. Uh, beer is just the, the so-called byproduct and, you know, in a 2050 year horizon of the, the protein, which is, you know, the, the nutrient, which is really going to make a difference on this planet. Um, and what our team, you know, a team of agronom agronomists and, you know, data scientists and breeding scientists and genomic scientists are doing is actually applying AI in a systematic and scaled way. They've been doing so for about 10 plus years. Um, and the one example, Harold, that's quite embedded within their process is what's called genomic selection, mm -hmm. right? So agronomy people are looking to optimize classically as they would for a beer company today. They're looking to optimize the best barley for malting, mm -hmm. for uh, for disease resistance in the field, for better yields or agronomic output, uh, better profits to the farmers, give them a reason to keep coming back year after year. For brewing, different ways that we want to extract that starch and, and get to get to alcohol faster. Mm -hmm. So any of those trays that are currently using AI to, to, to breed for today, mm -hmm. there's a world of possibility that they could take that in and just add different trays. What about protein digestibility? What about the exact polyphenol that we don't have enough of that could be more to get those antioxidant effects that we're hoping for? What about a increase in lysine? So we're now a complete protein due to a very specific breed or cross breed of barley in the field. And that's taking us back, you know, you think about those, um, those cycles for cross breeding, you've got about a 10 year journey in front of you, you know, to make sure that you're looking to select the right trace today, applying AI to speed up the selection of the right seeds to then see how they perform in the field, to then see how they perform in, in cross breeding for, for the next, you know, the next generation, if you will, of even better seeds. Um, and in a natural environment, some of that, you know, some of those selections would first of all be unoptimal, suboptimal. Um, and second of all, would just take like thousands of years to do what AI can do for us in just a, a morning at the office. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's incredible to see what they're up to and what they've embedded in the, in the process that is creating body varieties for beer. And what can we do in the future to make sure that we have that same level of tension and level of precision applied to, to the protein or fiber or polyphenols or any of the other micronutrients that we have? I mean, the electrolytes also a really wonderful untapped source of potential for particularly for athletes and for, for sports nutrition application. Um, so it really is just the, you know, the, the building blocks, the building blocks being in place. Of course, the way that we use AI is not, you know, what AI will be in 10, 20, 30 years from now. So how do we continue to grow our reliance on AI, our integration of AI into, into the business in a, in a positive and fruitful way that, you know, that benefits all? And how do we take that and, you know, layer it across the business to make sure that the trays that we're, we're breeding for are not just the beer, but for other elements of, of the food system and, and the food chain in general? That's cool. So. Um... And actually, Hannah, are there questions I should be thinking about? There are, yes. It's been very active in oh, that. Okay, so would cool. you like to answer? Um, I have to, before we go to the, I did, so what you just said, Jack, yeah, that was really stimulating and that, um, you know, the, uh, the Dave, UC Davis just received a gift from the Resnick family for $50 million, if I remember correctly. And it's around, it's to establish a an expertise set in terms of, upcycling ingredients from different different agricultural raw materials and as you were just laying out what you were laying out it, it really struck me that you know part of that activity set going forward from the uc davis perspective it really needs to include the expertise from aphis and you know this data analytics approach because really when we think about you know breeding crops now, and this would be a very futuristic way of looking at it, I suppose, but breeding crops and thinking about the food businesses we're involved in, we should also be thinking about the other uses of that material, which is obviously what you guys are doing. And um, I think the way you just described things summarizes that really well. So yes, Hannah. All right, um, so I'll start with a quick question. Um, 
Does the protein contain gluten? Great question. It does. Um, so gluten is, of course, a, a protein, which is um, something that's not always well understood by, by the world at large. Um, barley is one of the, the few grains between wheat and rye that are naturally gluten containing. And we actually quite, quite like it that way because of our sports nutrition focus. Of course, there is a, a piece here about celiacs, which comprise about 1% of, of the world's population which I would in no way, shape or form encourage to, to go near our protein um, for obvious reasons. But for the other 99% of folks, particularly folks who are looking to get the, you know, the, the founding molecules of gluten, which is glutamine and proline, two wonderful amino acids for sports, um, nutrition, muscle building, recovery, um, and just a, yeah, a way for athletes to get the protein that they, that they need. We have a ton of that in, in the body protein. And that's one of the reasons which, which makes it such a great fit for sports nutrition and athletic applications. Good to know. Thanks. Um, and then this next question, I think you've mentioned um, non-GMO in your talk. And um, this person is curious how non-GMO links to sustainability or was the mention there incidental? So yeah, a great, great shout. And we are non-GMO project uh, verified. So non-GMO is just something that is, you know, especially in the in the food system that we've created over the last 50, 50 plus years, it's worth noting that our product is natural. You know, it's from a natural source. Our process to extract the protein is super minimal, no harsh chemicals are used, and you get to a point where you can just eat protein from a plant source without too much human intervention or sort of genomic, crazy genomic intervention that, that is not needed, frankly, to get the, the nutrition that you need. So that's just something that we're quite proud of um, in terms of holding both the certifications for upcycled as well as for non-GMO project verified. And we do see that that's quite coveted and, and sought after in the marketplace today, um, that people are seeking out, if not organic, the non-GMO project verified status. Um, and then you, you answered this, I think um, you gave several examples about leveraging AI in your product development. So you anticipated that, that question there. Um, but we have a question about, um, has there been substantial variation in nutritional quality across incoming batches of plant material? And if so, how is this variation accounted for in product pipelines? Excellent question. I love this one because it's something that we do quite quite differently than, than many of the other plant proteins out there today. Um, and Hannah, it's simply related to the fact that we procure, if you will, all of our raw material from Anheuser-Busch um, that has decades-long relationships with farmers all over the world, direct relationships or indirect relationships with very, very tight specifications as to the incoming ingredients. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, we want our beers to taste the same every single time. No matter if you have a Bud Light in China or in the United States, it's going to taste the same. And what that means for, for Evergreen and Everpro is that our protein has a very, very similar nutrient, mineral, and, and sensory composition when it comes off the lines from, from beer type to beer type, if you will. So the Bud Light grains are going to taste the same every time. The Budweiser grains are going to taste the same every time. And that's something that is, you know, is not um, standardized for or foreseen in the wider commodities industry, if you will. Um, they take all the PE and all the soy and they don't have as tight specifications coming in because they don't need to. And they rely on food companies and food producers to, to deal with that. You know, whereas we're coming in as a, as a food and beverage producer with those very tight specs. And the ingredients coming out this, the other side are also, you know, conforming to that um, that tight spec benefit to the to the food manufacturer on the other side. Thank you. For that. Um, let's see. We also have a question here about um, life cycle assessment. Interested to hear how you are thinking about life cycle assessment for waste streams. Do you think there will be standard ways for calculating this in the future? Yes. Um, yeah, just a lot to unpack on, on that question. LCAs are a great tool, but I don't think they're the, the end game. You know, there is, there is a piece here about the Greatest Science-Based Target Initiative and what they, um, 
the framework they've created essentially for calculating scopes one, two, three, four emissions, emissions being obviously the most urgent environmental materiality area of business to address before you know things things get out of control. Um, and if you calculate on a on a corporate basis, that's one thing. Where does that leave smaller companies or more innovative, lower carbon companies to start with? But also, what does it mean for the products? And the products are sort of left behind. The LCA, the life cycle assessment for products, was sort of a patchwork to try to fill in the blanks for certain products. Um, you know that that come through the corporate reporting standards, which are more robust. And the European Union was actually the first to look at standardizing that that whole patchwork. I mean, we're looking just in the European Union alone, we're talking about more than two thousand different ways to calculate a product environmental footprint through LCA, 2,000 different ways. So they distilled all that down and they said, okay, cool, how do we how do we create a product environmental footprint category rules? Much like we have the back label USDA nutrition panels, which are standardized. We know where the calories are coming from. We know where the vitamins are coming from. We understand how to measure the nutritional value of all those things. Not perfect. It's an average of averages, but it, it does the job and it gets people the information that they need. The European Union has done that for, for a, a finite number of product categories. Um, and the way that you know more forward-looking regulation tends to work in the world today may change, but it often starts at a, at a very academic, very precise level out of the out of the European kind of bubble. And it tends to move to the states, China, Australia, Asia, become more practical, more implementable is much faster and much more widely adopted and is then taken on a sort of an incentives, benefits, punitive measures type of framework and pushed through to, to a framework which is, you know, standardized in, in the world today. So I feel like we're on that precipice where we, you know, Europe has done that, that heavy look for us and we're about to see the United States and parts of Asia pick up the category framework rules, simplify them, push them into, into legislation, get the right cost benefit measures in place from a regulatory perspective, um, and basically wipe out the LCA. You know, the LCA, as I said, is a, is a temporary measure to help us understand more or less where we are at. Um, but there is, unfortunately, depending on, on how you calculate or design the LCA, there can be quite a fair bit of cherry picking because it's a it's essentially a yeah a privatized approach to to measuring rather than a standardized nationalized um, regulatory framework if that makes sense it does thank you um and somewhat connected um how do the sustainability scores for everpro partition environmental costs from beer and those developed from the spent grain yes um so right now we're working we did both the value and the volume attribution calculation it came out much of a much, which is quite interesting. It's mainly because the, the liquid kgs, the beer and the you know the powder kgs protein are at a massive delta. Um, so that was kind of the volume attribution. The value attribution, as you can imagine, you know, something like a St. Louis brewery was built and is managed as an asset to produce beer. So it's it's a real like 90 plus percentage attribution to beer, 10, 10 minus percentage attribution to uh, to the protein. But knowing what some of those drivers are in the future of where our biggest emissions will come from, we can start to look at reducing them now when we have a smaller attribution. And instead of growing our baseline and having that mushroom over time, as our, as our volume allocation starts to grow, get more in line with the, the beer business, we can mitigate some of those potential um, incoming carbon shocks, right? So one is the spray dryer. We've got a huge seven-story a uh, tall spray dryer in St. Louis. How do we get that plugged into renewable energy as soon as possible? We've already got renewable electricity throughout the plant, but how do we get a you know, deal in place with the um, the local landfill folks to or take their methane and think about plugging that into our facility and, and get that spray, spray dry on renewable energy before it becomes a, you know, a problem at scale? And we're aware of all that stuff now while we're small. And similar to our approach with AI, we want to systematically spend some of our income on some of those programs to make sure we do it right from the beginning, rather than you know, ballooning this profitable business out with all these issues and trying to fix that when we're a, when we're a large scale company. 
Wonderful. Um, now, kind of switching gears to the consumer. Um, for the direct to consumer channel, what is your approach to educate and influence the masses? By Ali, you mean Evergreen? Yes. Okay. I, I qualify that question because we're part of obviously a large consumer consumer brand company that has access to consumers. So the um, the Evergreen plan is pretty simple, Hannah. We're working through our customers to get them all the information they need to help them create the consumer communications and raise the awareness that uh, that they can to, to help their customers and consumers understand the importance of number one, upcycling, number two, plant-based nutrition. Many of them do, otherwise they wouldn't be adopting our, our ingredients, uh, but just giving them those like zingers and those reasons to believe in what we do. Um, we also have a very close collaboration with the Upcycled Food Association. So we're one of the founding members. They do quite a bit of consumer awareness, retailer awareness and education. Um, you know, I'll speak on panels for them. I'll, you know, whenever they, they need something, we'll do little short videos for them, give them a case study and just help them to get the word out there that upcycling is the, the future. I mean, we've got a, we've got a potential third of a trillion pounds of food waste avoided just in our St. Louis facility alone when we're at scale. And what that means for this 160 billion problem, dollar problem here in the United States of food that's simply going to, to waste that could have otherwise been avoided. Um, it's not solving the whole problem, but it's certainly something to, to be proud of and just to get the, the word out there, get people excited and also understand that upcycle food can be you know, delicious and nutritious, not just helping to, helping to avoid that food waste um, in the first place. Great, thank you. Um, I'll do one more audience question, then I'll pivot back to you, Harold. Um, so soluble in beverages is certainly an attractive goal for some applications, but proteins also represent one of the most desirable structural elements in foods, doughs, gels, foams, etc., cetera, um, and are important additional functions that will define future successes. How are you looking into those while, of course, simultaneously disrupting nourishment, digestibility, and others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent question. Sounds like it's a, a food scientist there. So I'll do my best. I, I don't pretend to be a food scientist, but um, you know, the the heart of the matter here is that again, there is no like single nutrient that should be the, the base of our diet. I think there was a time in history where it was convenient to have like meats and potatoes on your plate every day and a little bit of greens or a little bit of reds just to, to spruce it up. But what we know from history is that, you know, humans thrived and flourished and became what we are today through eating plants and variety in abundance, eating nuts, eating legumes, eating our nutrients, getting our nutrients from different sources, depending on the season, depending on what was available, um, all fresh and, and whole. So I don't think it's, you know, it's a, it's a drawback really to have a particular formulation profile or, or performance forward approach to beverages when there is a whole host of other proteins that can service people's needs and in, in, in you know gelation type of applications if you want something squishy or creamy or or chewy you can get that and, and get that from other proteins and variety of abundance you could also combine everpro with other proteins so it goes great with pea protein with favor bean protein um, with chickpea protein you can see a trend on the, the legumes here uh, we also achieve a complete protein by the, the PDCAS standard for calculating that out in combination with, you know, if you take a grain and a legume, they generally combine to, to make that complete protein. And um, you, can, you can still actually get a pretty good beverage sensor experience. It's not going to be viscous like water. You're not going to have that like real wash, wash it down type of experience if you throw a legume protein in there. But you're going to get a like a, a nice, rich, creamy kind of creamer type of experience um, through through throwing in a legume. So I do think that's potentially one way to think about it. Is no single protein should solve all food and beverage problems everywhere, but think about how they can work together for better sensory experience, better nutrition experience even better um, performance in, in the field for, you know, if you're thinking about a cover crop, you've got barley growing, you got pea growing underneath, pea is fixing nitrogen, barley is taking up nitrogen. They have a symbiotic water cycle um, type of approach. 
So I think it's, yeah, it's, it's just good to acknowledge that plants do work harder together. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So um, just listening to you talk through that, and the previous questions, and so I am a food scientist, I'm a fossilized food scientist, but nevertheless, I am a food scientist. <laughs> and so I really appreciate that last question and the way you were just talking through stuff. Um, I think that you know, in order to address the grand challenges that the food system represents, there's a piece which is they're solving problems faster, better, more cost-effectively within each piece of the value chain. And I think you have done a good job of illustrating that upcycling adds another piece there. I think there's also a piece of solving um, or accelerating innovations faster, better, more cost effectively between, you know, at the interface of those pieces of the value chain. And so what you were just talking about and then just listening to you for the last 30 minutes, um, I think there's a piece here and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But for me, a light bulb that was going off is as Evergreen is actually organizing itself in a data science and you know data analytics way, you can actually help your customer. You can help your customers innovate faster by actually utilizing these tools yourself. So I'd love to hear your your thoughts on you know. Do you see AI not only helping you solve your internal problems better, but also helping you solve your customers' problems better? Yeah, absolutely, Harold. I think it's, you know, it's evident to most folks that the fact that the food system was created in silos and data isn't shared between different actors in the food system is a real challenge to making progress, being for human health, planetary health, affordable nutrition, you know, getting people what they need um, at the right time, place and, and cost. So the way I, I see it, and of course, we, you know, at Evergreen, we, we try to go step by step. We're always running a million miles an hour, trying to service our customers, trying to, you know, make product and sell product, which is really the core of our, our little operation there. But embedding some of the thinking, as you say, that meets consumer needs via our relationship with customers. Um, and there's one thing that, that I always come back to, particularly from my seat in, in marketing and sustainability, is how can we help people design the products which have the highest nutrition value, the best taste at the lowest carbon footprint? And there are so many pieces of the puzzle there that need to get in that calculation that no single human is going to have the knowledge, the time, the interest to, to attack that problem for every single iteration of every single formulation that our customers are working on. So how can we use some of these partnerships that we have, you know, like, um, like Ilias from, from the Pippet team to think about offshoots of our, you know, our current AI data lake, if you will, that we're building. How do we think about building it in such a way that can facilitate incoming data in the future that will solve customers' problems and eventually consumer problems mm -hmm. faster? Is that something like a um, an open data data sharing agreement with some of our customers that we contract in at the very beginning, not really knowing what we're going to do with it, but having the best intentions to to use it in the best way for both parties and and for consumers? Is it something that we look at a particular strategic partner, strategic customer, and we offer them an extension of the work that we're doing with some of our AI partners? You know, how can we how can we play the partnership? role in brokering some of those those deals or some of those relationships that just mean that we're all using the same data and then we can all leverage that data for, for higher purposes in a future scenario, hopefully, hopefully a near future scenario. So, you know, to that end, I'm, I'm aware that, um, that uh, UC Davis hosted um, the Rockefeller Foundation and yeah, the, the, the foundation works with, with a lot of different universities, including other um, groups that are part of the APHIS um, university cluster. So um, how do you foresee, uh, you know, number one, Evergrain fitting into, you know, not only call it premium categories like sports nutrition, which you've mentioned, but also thinking about solving food security you know, sorts of challenges as well. And can you see um, the, the data science and the AI playing a role in that in a precision nutrition, you know, sort of perspective? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's that's a super interesting question, Harold, because it kind of blows out the the partnership comment um, all the way to to civil society. And I mean, the the way that that Evergreen was founded, coming back to our story there in, in 2013, was like we're giving this stuff to animals when people are literally going hungry all over the world and can benefit from this from this nutrition. Um, and as we think about our, our strategy and commercialization, you know, we know we got to make it to spend it. You know, so that's really the, the premiumization piece. How do we build a business that services a group of people who are willing to pay for something that really gets them to their goals, like an athlete who, who is so dependent on nutrition and protein to reach their goals? And then how do we create a strategy that ladders all the way from the, you know, the top to the bottom of the, of the, the pyramid, if you will, of nutrition and, and economic needs? Um, we've talked at length with our colleagues in the African breweries, in the South American breweries, about putting up a more cost-effective way to process the, the brewers spent grains coming out um, and creating very simple porridges or um, meal replacements, ideally with the, the fiber inclusive, you know, to make sure folks are getting their carbs. Um, we've also looked at, as you say, just ways to work with the Rockefeller Foundation or Rise Against Hunger is another partner of ours that we did a, a donation to last year. We donated about 20 tons of protein-rich pasta to, to um, folks who are, who are suffering from the Ukrainian conflict. And that was pasta that contained 20 grams of protein in a single serving. So you don't need to get your protein from a very difficult to find, difficult to source, animal or dairy source under those under those conditions. Um, so that's, you know, that that really is the way that we see our organization evolving. We don't just want to service folks that already get all the protein that they need, but could get it from a more sustainable or more nutritious plant source. We want to make sure that we think about the different um, different layers of the pyramid here. And we unlock the um the needs as well as the the sort of the will, the political and and sort of internal financing will to get to get what people need out to them faster. Um, the way that I see data playing a role in that, Harold, is probably minimal to start just because these people have a very, very simple need, which is to get food in their bellies and in their children's bellies and to get an education and to think about the way that that can change their, their lives for the better. Um, is there a way that we can match climate data, um, hunger, you know, real hunger crises, maybe that are even on the horizon that we're not even aware of just yet and create a more global approach to supporting emergency relief, disaster relief, uh, which we do today, by the way, through Anheuser-Busch's and other, other companies of Anheuser-Busch globally um, through a disaster relief water program. Can we do that proactively and not reactively? Um, thinking about the way that we look at, you know, the data science and the, the overall forecasting or disaster zones in our organization. We, we have all that data, we're sitting on it. Can we find a way to bring that into the conversation around meeting um, folks who are facing acute malnutrition needs today? Awesome, I know we're at time, so I'll just you know bring it to a close and then hand it over to, to Hannah to, to close things off the session. But I just wanna thank you very much for um, for doing this session, it really, I mean, honestly, the, this was a great discussion because it really, what you did is you expanded the envelope of our understanding of the whole food system. And this last piece, I think also, you know, spanning from sports nutrition to food security issues, predicting food security issues through climate science. Yeah, these are all the things that we think about with APHIS. So really appreciate the conversation and for expanding our, you know, minds when it comes to the food system, sort of thinking and upside. So thank you very much. And I'll hand it over to him. Yes, thank you so much, Jackie, for being with us today. Um, this has been a really great conversation. Um, and um, our next talk will be Emily Ma from Google's Food for Good initiative. Um, we are uh, that's been postponed from April 19th. We're looking at a new date, probably May 3rd, um, but you can stay posted on our website or sign up for our newsletter to hear about when that talk is going to be. Um, so thank you for joining us today and have a good rest of your afternoon.